Hey yo, thanks for tuning in to The Source, your source for celebrity news. Check this out. Let's begin this video with the question of the day, and that is this. Should your bank or financial institution be able to limit your access to your own bank account if someone who works at the bank thinks or suspects that you have dementia? If your answer is yes, should this ability for the bank to be able to freeze your account also apply if the bank suspects that you have a gambling addiction? Let me know in the comments. All right, so today my mission is pretty straightforward. I'm going to try to break down this Wendy Williams guardianship in such a way that even a baby could understand so we could get to the bottom of what's really going on with Wendy Williams. Okay, let's start with the diagnosis. By now you've all heard that Wendy Williams has been diagnosed with primary progressive aphasia and frontal temporal dementia, which are both diseases that affect your cognitive abilities, which mean thinking, behavioral abilities, which means how you act, and physical abilities, which means how you move. Doctor, can you please break this down a little bit more for the people? Guys, this is a group of disorders, frontotemporal dementia, that happen when nerve cells in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain are lost. Now, just so you know, the frontal part of the brain is here. The temporal part is kind of in this area, in this area. Frontotemporal dementia can really affect a number of aspects of our sort of person, our behavior, our personality, our language, even movement. These dementias, these frontotemporal dementias, um, are actually among the most common dementias to affect young people. So oftentimes we see people ages 40 to 65 with frontotemporal dementias. Um, and there's multiple different types, right? Subtypes of this. Some of these subtypes affect, um, say, behavior more. Some of these subtypes affect speech more. Some um, movement is affected more. But the symptoms are something you really should know about. Um, these are maybe not the typical dementia symptoms you may think about. These may be changes in your behavior or personality. A person may have a loss of empathy or like problems with interpersonal skills. Um, they may not express judgment as well, or they might have a loss of inhibition, be inhibited. They also might have a lack of interest, just no longer be interested in things, which can actually be mistaken for depression. Um, there are other symptoms as well. Sometimes there's compulsive behaviors. Uh, sometimes there's smacking lips or clapping or things that people do all the time. And there even may be other changes. Um, decline in, in personal hygiene or changes in eating habits as well. You see what I mean when I say, like when we think about dementia, often we think about memory, but this is a, a type of dementia where memory, yes, can be involved, but it's not necessarily the forefront symptoms. Now, as I mentioned, there are other different types of frontotemporal dementia. Uh, another type affects speech and language. This is important because uh, some of these speech and language problems that someone might have is uh, they might have increased difficulty using and understanding written and spoken language. So like they might have uh, trouble finding the right word to use in speech or even in naming objects. Uh, again, the naming things is a big thing, possibly replacing a specific specific word with a more general word saying, um, can I have it? Instead of saying, can I have the pen? Um, no longer knowing what certain words mean, having hesitant speech, things like that. There's also types that involve more motor related symptoms, things like people may have tremor or rigidity, even muscle spasms. Um, they might have problems with coordination or might have falls, muscle weakness. So you see the symptoms really can range. They really can be on a spectrum. The thing about frontotemporal dementia is that there's not a cure but there are medications and treatments that may help symptoms, which is very important. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more to say about this type of dementia. Um, it's just one of many dementias, but again, it tends to affect younger people. And the symptoms may be different than what we typically think about when we think about dementia. Um, what's suffice it to say is this is a very important condition that really can affect people's lives, not only the patient, but the family as well. And a team of people are likely going to be needed to assist, whether it's physical therapy, speech therapy, uh, neurologists, primary care doctors, etc. There you have it. So now, a lot of people are wondering whether Wendy Williams' current condition is in any way related to her past history of drug abuse and the time that she fell out when she was doing her show. Uh, how you doing? Halloween uh, costume contest. We do it every year. It's always a lot of fun. Let's get started. Our first caress. <laughs> That was not a stunt. 
I'm overheated in my costume and I did pass out. But you know what? I'm a champ and I'm back. The answer is this. Yes, Y-E-S. The fact that Wendy Williams used to use crack and cocaine back in the day when she worked the Kiss and the fact that she's a heavy drinker are definitely contributing factors because over time, both cocaine and alcohol can impair and damage the brain beyond repair. And as far as Wendy Williams falling out on the set is concerned, I don't know if it's related, but the fact that they just propped her back up there to finish the show instead of rushing her to the hospital to get an MRI certainly didn't help the situation. Now I know, somebody's gonna come in the comment section like, Sauce, Wendy might drink a little, but she ain't use no crack. Listen, what rock are you living under? Some of the things that Whitney and I have in common that um, bonded us, the love of our mother and father, Whitney and I, same age, um, and both plagues with um, the demon of substance abuse. been almost 15 years since I smoked last from a crack pipe. It's been almost 15 years since I waited on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx for my drugs. Okay, case closed. Sometimes you got to go straight to the source. Now, Wendy's official diagnosis has made a lot of people question whether or not Wendy could have ever actually granted permission to Lifetime to make this documentary. And they also want to know whether or not Wendy is being exploited by her handlers, including her manager Will Selby and the reps over there at Wells Fargo, who Wendy alleges are trying to steal all of her money. All right, so as far as Wendy Williams authorizing and co-producing the documentary is concerned, Wendy Williams' niece, Alex Finney, went on GMA the other day and said that her aunt signed off on the documentary 100%. Check this out. It is heartbreaking when you think where she was and who she is now. Some people are going to look at this and say, this is exploitation. She's being exploited. How could they do this? Right. What, what do you say to that? You know, and I understand that people will look at it and some people look at it and think that. But I will say this, first and foremost, my aunt is the executive producer of this documentary. And when I finally talked with her and I said to her, Aunt Wendy, why are you, do you want to do this? You know, you're clearly the health piece, all of that has to be addressed. Is now the right time? And she said, now is the perfect time because I want to take ownership of my story. Interesting, but a lot of people don't believe this because criminal profiler Pat Brown believes that there's no way in the world that Wendy Williams could have signed off on this documentary given her current condition. Check this out. She has dementia. If you have dementia, you cannot consent to anything. You cannot. You don't have the understanding of what's going on, what it means to you, what everybody else is taking, how they're taking advantage of you. Now, mind you, her, a lot of her relatives have jumped on board. Because why? Because they're getting fame or because they're getting money. One of these two things or both of these two things. And if you're one of those relatives, I'm not going to point you out. You suck. So here's the thing. Some people are saying that Wendy Williams signed a three movie deal with Lifetime back when she was lucid prior to 2020. And if that's the case, she technically in legalese could have consented not to this particular movie, but to a movie. However, if that's not the case and Lifetime approached her anytime after like 2021, 22, I don't think that there's any way that Wendy could have possibly consented to this movie. Now, I have a family member with alcohol induced dementia and I can tell you right now, there are times when they appear to have a certain level of clarity, but that's not really the case. And if I stick a piece of paper in front of their face and I'm like, Uncle Tommy, sign this, they're gonna sign it but that doesn't mean that they have any idea of what they're signing. And let me say this, if somebody signs something and then three seconds later, they don't remember that they signed it, then can they really consent? Drive past the Wendy Williams show. Thanks. Excuse me, can you drive a little bit faster? And, and you know, we won't get uh, stopped by the police. I'm famous and I never go out. And everything that I have on is delicious. 
Here's the Wendy Williams show right here on your left. Look, look Wendy, over here. That's the Wendy Williams show. Okay. Stay right. Stay right. This is the same. Yeah, this is the one we were just at. Oh, my God. Okay, driver. Uh -huh. I said, I'm not going to this place. It's, we're not here. It's right here. It's right. a smoke shop right there. Same one. It's, we just passed it. Same one. Same one. Oh, okay. I'm so glad I'm not on the Wendy Williams show. This is all too much. Are you worried about Wendy? Uh, this stage of her life, yeah. From when I first met Wendy, she was, she had a beautiful personality. Now it's just like, I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't know what she's going through, but it's getting very intense, whatever she's going through. I think she's losing memory. Have you guys that? I want you guys to notice something. One thing that's very evident throughout the documentary is that while Wendy's team is quick to point out her alcohol abuse, they don't want to fully acknowledge her dementia or they don't really have a proper understanding of dementia, which is going to become very important when we talk about Wells Fargo and the guardianship in a minute. Now, I find it very interesting that Wendy's son, Kevin Jr., actually appeared in a documentary because Kevin Jr. discussed the unscripted documentary in an interview that he did with The Sun in 2023. And in that interview, Kevin said that when Wendy's manager slash jeweler, William Selby, approached him about making the documentary, he said no. Kevin said, the jeweler reached out to me last year and he basically said, we're planning on this project being a way that would tell the public about what's happening. And I was opposed to it. I felt like, and I still feel like, she shouldn't be doing anything that involves putting herself in front of the camera. It goes back to putting work first and herself second. I was then re-approached by production, not by Will directly a second time, and I just said no. They tried to offer me $25,000 to appear in the unscripted project with executive producer credit, and I chose not to do it for the simple fact that I just felt like however this thing came about was under a contract she shouldn't have agreed to for a project that went and paint her in a good light. All right, so it appears that Kevin Hunter Jr. changed his mind and he also took the 25K along with the production credit. See, this right here is interesting and I'm really wondering what made Kevin Jr. change his mind. Like how do you go from saying that your mother would have never agreed to the contract to agreeing to the contract? Okay, so here's the thing. Lifetime started filming this documentary in 2022 and we all know by then that Wendy wasn't really Wendy. But even though Wendy wasn't Wendy, William Selby, her manager slash jeweler, was running around as late as 2023 doing interviews saying that Kevin Jr. was lying when he said something was up with his mother and that Wendy was all good. Check this out. If your mother was near death, would the first thing you do is call an online publication? I'm not trying to have a debate with Kevin. I'm not here to be combative about, you know, whatever allegations he has. You know, he's entitled to his opinion. I'm just trying to say that us as adults, let's be responsible and let's actually utilize some common sense. You know, someone was near death, someone like your mother. Why would you go to an online publication to discuss it with them? Wendy is taking the steps to um, be in a better space. She's progressing very well. She looks healthy. She sounds healthy. And I think she's doing amazing. She's in good spirits. She's happy. She she is so ambitious. She loves to work. She profusely tells me ideas and thoughts and, and uh, things she wants to do next. I know Wendy wants to do a podcast. She is excited about doing a podcast. She feels like it's the best of both worlds where they get to hear her voice and then they get her, you know, visually, you know, doing her thing. Look, as was very evident in the documentary, Wendy does want to do a podcast because all of Wendy is not gone and part of her is still longing to do what she loves to do. I mean, Wendy was two minutes away from screwing that personal trainer. If he'd have tugged on her leg a little harder, it'd have been over. <laughs> But if William Selby really cared about Wendy, he would have dropped the curtain on the show a long time ago because he knows darn well that Wendy cannot do a podcast. But he's never going to shut down the circus because if he and the other members of Wendy's team acknowledge that she's mentally incapacitated, they all lose their jobs. No more checks for Selby, which is why he's more prone to push the alcohol narrative because that makes it seem that if Wendy just stops drinking, she can make a full recovery. But that's not the case because that's not how alcohol-related dementia works. 
Even if she was to stop drinking today, that dementia is not going away and her aphasia is progressive, which means it's going to progress. Now, what I'm getting ready to say next is my opinion, not fact, and I want to distinguish that. I believe that certain scenes in this documentary were staged by William Selby. For example, when he walks into her bedroom and he finds the bottle of liquor and then he goes over to the dresser and gets that large wad of cash, I believe that's staged. Wendy, can you wake up please? I wasn't asleep. Okay. How's everything? Great. Cash in your jewelry box. Huh? Why do you got all this money just in the house? Boss. You brought it to me. I just thought that you would put it in the bank at some point. Cash, you got at king. least about 10, 15 bands here. Cash is king. Cash is king, but you also got to keep it safe. You don't want to put it in the bank? You love that, that green paper, huh? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Will? Yes? Is the cash here also because if it goes to the bank, it goes away? No, that's not true. I created a separate account for her. Okay, so P. Pattis makes absolutely no sense. First, he asked Wendy why she has the money, knowing full darn well that he gave her the money. So, this right here was to show us that he gives her all of her money. Then, he asked her, how come you didn't put it in a bank? How in the world is Wendy supposed to put the money in a bank unless the management team, which is you, sets up a trip to the bank so she can put the money in there? But, that was put in the movie to show that Will protects her money. And three, when the producer asked about the money, Will divulges that he set up a separate account for Wendy. How in the heck would you set up a separate account for Wendy unless you put the account under your own name to hide it from the Guardian and you hit her off with a debit card or something? And also, if you did set up the secret account, why in the world would you divulge that in the documentary? But in my opinion, and yes, once again, this is my opinion, that was to show us that he gives Wendy 24-7 access to her money. See, y'all got to remember one thing about this documentary. The whole staff is aware that they're being filmed, so they're acting accordingly. Listen, because we definitely can't trust her manager or her handlers or her guardian or Wells Fargo or maybe even some of the family except for maybe Kevin Jr. and definitely the nephew. We're going to have to backtrack and look at what Wendy Williams had to say about her own situation herself. My thing is that I've been asking questions about my money. And when I began asking questions about my money, suddenly Lori Schiller has got no response regarding my money. I want my money, this is not fair. And Wells Fargo has no questions and answers with regarding my money. This is, this is not fair. And Lori Schiller and Wells Fargo have this guardianship petition about keeping me away from my money. This is not right. And you know this is not fair. And this guy named Bernie Young, I know for a fact that Bernie Young used my American Express card to hire an attorney to file a petition against me. That was done with my American Express card. Bernie Young, you're no good. And this is not fair at all, you know? And then there's this person, um, this, uh, oh gosh, this, uh, a former, a former doctor, a former doctor, okay, had medical information about me that I never even got. It was sent over to Lori Schiller. So I haven't gotten the stuff. I fired the, the doctor. And again, all I wanna know is where is my money? This is not right. And certainly, this is not fair. This is not fair. You know, Wells Fargo has used all this stuff to create the guardianship over me. This is not right. And certainly this is not fair. 
the New York court system is, they, you know, uh, without evidence, they're being weird to me, this court system. Without evidence, uh, they took all this information and continued with what's going on with me based on what Wells Fargo is doing. This is not fair, this is not fair, you know? And the New York court, the New York court is treating me like they did in, do you remember Kung Fu judge case? Do you remember that Kung Fu judge case? That's not right and that is not fair. Lori Schiller, Bernie Young, and Wells Fargo. Please let me have access to my money. This is not right. And again, this is not fair. Have a pleasant day. Thank you. Wendy Williams mentioned a couple of people in that video that she felt were shady and were trying to do her dirty. And we're gonna look at each and every one of them. Source, can you please pull up my evidence board? All right, so first you have Lori Schiller. Lori Schiller is Wendy's financial manager over there at Wells Fargo, which means that she basically oversees the millions of dollars that Wendy has in a bank. She also gives Wendy advice and makes investments in her stocks and portfolio. But allegedly, when Wendy got divorced from Kevin Hunter, she decided that she didn't want to work with Lori anymore, so she was getting ready to fire her. But before Wendy could give it an ax, Lori sent a letter to the higher ups at Wells Fargo notifying them that she didn't feel that Wendy was of sound mind. And she also said that in her expert opinion, not as a medical doctor, but as a broker, she believed that not only was Wendy mentally incapable of handling her own money, but she also said that Wendy was being exploited financially. One particular example that Lori gave to prove that people were taking advantage of Wendy was that Wendy's son, Kevin Jr., was running up significant debt on Wendy's Amex. Now, after the bank put a stop on the card, according to Kevin Jr., he informed the bank that his mother was in his care down there in Florida when all of the transactions were made to her American Express. And he also told the bank that his mother had authorized all the transactions, including $120,000 for his birthday party, $80,000 for his rent, and over $120,000 in Uber Eats charges. Um, I think the amount of money that they questioned Kevin about for spending was like $100,000. To put in perspective, Kevin's birthday party that year that his mom threw was $120,000. Kevin's rent was $80,000. Kevin's Uber Eats probably exceeded $100,000 that his mom approves. So for them to have a court case and rip him away from taking care of his mother, it's very questionable. Okay. So Lori Schiller doesn't believe Kevin, and she's like, there's no way, no how, that Wendy Williams authorized $120,000 in Uber Eats. After this exchange, Lori tells Kevin Jr. that if he is in fact Wendy's caretaker, he needs to provide the bank documentation showing that he's Wendy's authorized power of attorney in order to be able to access Wendy's funds. And here's where things go wrong. Kevin Jr. submits the paperwork to the bank showing that he's Wendy Williams' authorized power of attorney. But the copy that he sent to the bank was not notarized. So Lori Schiller was like, I'm not accepting this. I need a notarized copy because how would I know that this is actually Wendy Williams' signature? So Kevin Jr. turns around and submits a new power of attorney to the bank and this one does have the signature with the notary. However, Lori Schiller is like, I gotta send this to my legal team because how in the world did Wendy Williams sign this today in front of a notary when she's not in her right state of mind? All right, so Wendy Williams, Kevin Jr. and her attorney decide that they're gonna give Wells Fargo up until February 3rd, 2022 to make a decision. And if they don't hear anything back by that time, they're gonna take legal action. During the same time, Wells Fargo's legal team decided that Kevin's power of attorney held no weight because of the notarized signature date. And they hired an attorney named David Pikus from the law firm Bressler, Amory & Ross to petition the court to appoint a legal guardian for Wendy. 
All right, so we all know that LaShawn Thomas is Wendy's usual attorney, right? And she works at a Miami Entertainment Law Group. However, she can't help Wendy in this situation because she's not licensed in New York. And also, there's a conflict of interest because LaShawn also represents Wendy's ex, Kevin Hunter. So LaShawn passes the ball to Celeste in McCaw, who's an attorney that works out of New York. Now, Celeste has only been practicing for like three years. But Celeste goes ahead and she files a petition on Wendy's behalf on February 4th, 2022. Source, can you pull up that paperwork? And I know, somebody out there is like, Source, I thought the paperwork was sealed. It is. Shh, don't tell nobody. All right, so in the paperwork that was filed with the court, it says, Celeste in McCaw, an attorney duly licensed to practice law in the state of New York, hereby affirms the following under penalty of perjury. One, I am an attorney with Miami Entertainment Law Group attorneys for the petitioner Wendy Hunter in this action. So what do you notice? Miami Entertainment Law Group is the same law group that LaShawn Thomas works at. And guess what? There's no Miami Entertainment Law Group in New York. So therefore, this chick is basically filing paperwork for LaShawn, who still happens to represent who? Wendy's ex-husband, Kevin Hunter. Can you say conflict of interest? And I know darn well, when the judge saw that, the judge must have been like, hmm, this right here is sus. So this right here is Kevin Jr.'s mistake number two, because you don't go hire the attorney that's affiliated with your father's attorney when your father is out here trying to get money from Wendy Williams. All right, so the paperwork goes on to say, I am fully familiar with the facts and circumstances described herein and in the accompanying petitioning papers. I submit this affirmation together with the affirmation of Wendy Hunter dated February 3rd, 2022, in support of Hunter's emergency petition for preliminary injunction, temporary restraining order, and other relief in aid of pending arbitration dated February 4th, 2022. By order to show cause for preliminary injunction and temporary restraining order, pursuant to Article 63 of the CPLR and CPLR 7502 and joining and restraining respondent Wells Fargo Clearing Services LLC DBA Wells Fargo Advisors respondent or Wells Fargo and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing all of the petitioner's accounts including but not limited to personal, business, deferred compensation, and investment accounts, and interfering with her right to access her financial assets and statements, pending a financial binding decision by an arbitrator, and for such further relief as this court deems just and proper. On February 4th, 2022, Hunter commenced this special proceeding by filing the emergency petition, asserting, among others, that Hunter is likely to succeed on the merits regarding causes of action against Wells Fargo for declaratory relief and breaches of fiduciary duty based on Wells Fargo's refusal to allow Hunter access to her financial assets and property. As explained more fully in the emergency petition, Hunter is entitled to a preliminary injunction and temporary restraining order in joining and restraining respondent and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing petitioner's accounts, including, but not limited to, personal, business, deferred compensation, and investment accounts, and interfering with her right to access her financial assets and statements because petitioner can show, one, a probability of success on the merits, two, the danger of irreparable injury in the absence of injunctive relief, and and three, a balance of the equities in her favor. Hunter can show probability of success on the merits since, as set forth in the emergency petition, along with Hunter's affirmation, there's a bona fide controversy between petitioner and respondent, which Hunter has been unable to resolve absent of judicial and arbitrational intervention. Despite several requests for respondent to reopen Hunter's accounts on the grounds that Hunter has sustained immediate and irreparable damages as a result of Wells Fargo's breach of its fiduciary duty. Hunter has already suffered and is in danger of continuing to suffer imminent and irreparable harm in that Wells Fargo's refusal to unfreeze Hunter's accounts and financial assets poses a serious financial hardship to the health and safety of Petitioner, her family, and her business. The balance of equities favor Hunter, since there's no evidence that injunctive relief would impose a hardship upon respondent, and Hunter's financial viability is subject to imminent and irreparable harm as a direct result 
result of respondents' actions or lack thereof. This petition is being made as a request for emergency relief because until Wells Fargo reopens Hunter's accounts and allows her to access her financial assets, Petitioner, her family, and her business are at risk of imminent and irreparable financial harm while continuing to endure ongoing financial obligations. No prior application has been made for this or any other similar relief. Wherefore, it is respectfully requested that the court grant petitioner's emergency petition for a preliminary injunction and temporary restraining order and issue an order enjoining and restraining respondent and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing petitioner's accounts, including but not limited to personal business deferred compensation and investment accounts and interfering with her right to access her financial assets and statements and for such further relief as the court deems just and proper. Dated February 4th, 2022. So after Wendy Williams submits that petition to the court, David Pikus, who once again is Wells Fargo's attorney, turns around and sends the following letter to the court. And his letter says, This firm represents Wells Fargo Clearance Services Incorporated, DBA Wells Fargo Advisors, the name respondent in the above proceeding. We are writing to ensure that the court is aware of our representation and to facilitate our participation in any application of the petitioner for provisional remedy, a courtesy copy of our notice of appearance is enclosed. We also want to inform the court that Wells Fargo has filed a petition in the guardianship part for an appointment of a guardian of the property of the petitioner herein under Article 81 of the Mental Hygiene Law. We would welcome the opportunity to provide your honor and opposing counsel with a copy of the guardianship petition, but would like to do so under seal or in another manner that will preserve the confidential nature of the guardianship proceeding. To summarize what Without divulging too much on the public record, Wells Fargo has a strong reason to believe that the petitioner is the victim of undue influence and financial exploitation. The petitioner is an established client of Wells Fargo and, notably, 15 years with a particular financial advisor, a 23-year veteran of the financial services industry with an unblemished record. Wells Fargo is relying not only on reports of the financial advisor, who has recently witnessed telltale signs of exploitation including the petitioner's own expressed apprehensions, but also upon other independent third parties who know the petitioner well and share these same concerns. So David Pikus goes on to say that Wells Fargo is a mandatory reporter and they're just trying to do right by Wendy. On February 11th, Wendy's attorney submits some more paperwork to the court, which includes Wendy Williams' official affirmation. And in that affirmation, Wendy Williams says, To my knowledge, all of the facts stated in this affirmation are true and correct. I am over 18 years of age, and I am fully competent to make this affirmation. Okay, so I'm going to skip down to bullet point number five because three and four are basically like redundant. Five says, this request for relief arises from, among other things, Wells Fargo's failure and refusal to reopen my personal business deferred compensation and investment accounts and unfreeze my financial assets, which has caused and is causing imminent irreparable financial harm to myself, my family, and my business. For more than two weeks, Wells Fargo has repeatedly denied my request to access my financial assets, which total over several million dollars. I have submitted Submitted multiple written requests to Wells Fargo and I have visited various Wells Fargo branches in the South Florida area in an effort to resolve this matter outside of the courtroom. To date, I have submitted and made over a dozen requests regarding the financial damages resulting from Wells Fargo's decision to unlawfully deny me access to my accounts. As a result of my inability to access my financial assets, I have defaulted and am at risk of defaulting on several billing and financial obligations, including but not limited to mortgage payments and employee payroll. In response to my request, Wells Fargo has informed me that their determination to deny me access to my accounts is based on the advisement of my former financial advisor, Lori Schiller, who alleged that I was of unsound mind. Despite my decision to terminate Schiller as a result of her improper conduct in relation to my accounts, Wells Fargo continues to deny me access to my financial assets and statements. 
Given the imminent and irreparable financial damage directly resulting from Wells Fargo's actions, I demanded that Wells Fargo reopen my personal business deferred compensation and investment accounts, unfreeze my financial assets, and allow me access to my bank statements immediately, or else I would have no choice but to seek the court's intervention. Despite overtures that their in-house legal team would give a ruling after I provided them with a properly executed, witnessed, and notarized power of attorney and signed letter of representation as requested, Wells Fargo has yet to advise me of their legal team's decision and has instead engaged Bressler, Amory, and Ross PC as their legal counsel regarding this dispute. Okay, so the case proceeds forward and goes to court in front of Justice Arlene Bluth, and she decides that Kevin Hunter Jr. is not the best person to care for Wendy, and I'm assuming that this is because he may not be the best steward over Wendy's finances, because he does things like ordering $120,000 worth of Uber Eats, and he may not be mature enough to manage her multi-million dollar estate. The court also decides that Wendy's sister Wanda isn't the best person to care for Wendy at this point either because she doesn't have enough experience, one, dealing with someone with dementia, and she, too, may not be able to manage Wendy's empire. So the court tells her that she may need to take a few courses before she can be considered to be Wendy's guardian. Another factor that may have hindered Wanda's ability to become Wendy's guardian is that Wendy's ex-husband, Kevin Hunter, accused Wanda of colluding with Debmar Mercury, which is the company that owns Wendy's syndicated show, to steal $15 million from Wendy. And I know, somebody out there is like, what about her brother Tommy? Can't he do it? Um, Tommy is somewhat problematic because Tommy has a YouTube channel with like 15,000 followers and in some of his shows he's driving around Florida ranting about Wendy. So Tommy has a history of using Wendy's name to sort of make money and the courts really don't trust that. So Tommy's not going to be the guardian. There was a time when I did to the horn. I was getting kind of into and I'll be honest I was getting into you know being on I love talking. I'm a talker. The whole family, we're talkers, we're communicators. We do it, that's what we do, all day. Every day, folks, every day. You might not hear what I have to say all day, but I'm talking, okay? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, will also, I just wanna say that. I also wanna say, you know, Alex talked, okay? She, she, she's a member of the family. She's one of the, you know, next generation members of the family. And you know what? We all make hiccups sometimes. I truly believe that this is Wendy's project. And I had to evolve and get to this point of understanding that I have a job. It has nothing to do with Wendy. She has a job that had nothing to do with Tommy. Unless I was invited in or come on the show or whatever, or I say, hey, Wendy, come on and be a part of this. Or would you like to, right? And I understand that now. So my perspective is different from that of the other members of the family, because I truly feel as though after having gone through what I went through with my sister, Wendy, I chose to stay in my lane and wait. Like everybody else, wait for the show. See how it's gonna go down. That's her project. See what she has to say about it, you know? See what she has to say. Well, you know what? It took a while, because guess what, everybody? She's fully capable to put sentences together and communicate her things. Wendy is so on point right now. Right now, 2024, on this day. See, you have a lot of clips that are out there. You have a lot of clips that are out there from, you know, different excerpts from whatever, you know, tapings over the years, all for the documentation, everybody. This is the documentation. It's being doc. It was documented. And see, you can't erase the past. The past is the past. And because Wendy wanted to include all this footage, you're going to see the, the good, the bad, not the good. You're going to see the bad and the ugly and the ugly er, I'm sure. And you're going to sit back and, and quite frankly, I'm going to sit back and say, wow. Yeah, as you can see, Tommy is an interesting character. Now, out of nowhere, I mean out of nowhere, Wells Fargo suggests that Wendy's ex-manager, Bernie Young, who Wendy fired like a year before these proceedings, would be a good person to be a potential guardian for Wendy because he would act in her best interests. He knows Wendy and he also knows the business. 
However, Wendy Williams vehemently objected to Bernie Young becoming a legal guardian, and she claimed that Bernie had charged up $10,000 on her American Express to hire a lawyer so that he could pursue guardianship. Alright, so after evaluating all of the potential candidates for guardianship, Justice Arlene Bluth decides none of y'all are good candidates, and she appoints Sabrina Morrissey to be Wendy Williams' new official guardian. According to sources, attorney Sabrina Morrissey, who currently serves as an associate of Morrissey LLP, is currently responsible for Wendy's welfare and she controls her assets. Morrissey's law practice focuses on trust and estates law, guardianships, and small corporation matters. And as per her bio, Sabrina works with senior citizens as well as those with physical and psychological disorders as she is qualified to serve as a special referee, guardian, guardian ad litem, court evaluator, and attorney for alleged incapacitated persons. Alright, so there you have it. Now, here are my thoughts on this entire situation. I'm not completely happy with the family and I'm not happy with that guardian. Because first off, the minute that the family realized that Wendy was discombobulated and having issues with her health that included memory loss and issues with formulating her thoughts and words, not a day should have gone by where a member of the family or a family friend wasn't with Wendy. Like, you can't leave her alone in the crib to fend for herself. That's ridiculous. Even if you have to bring in a home health aide, you gotta do something. Because the WAC co-workers, including Will Selby, Sean Zanotti, and Keisha, are not supposed to be caring for Wendy. I mean, she's got no food in the crib, the place is cluttered, and we all know that Wendy doesn't get down like that. But, let's keep it real. If you were to get sick tomorrow, who's supposed to be taking care of you? Your co-workers and your employees? Or your family? With that being said, I think that part of the problem is that for a while, the family was in denial and they wouldn't or couldn't accept what was really going on with Wendy. For example, I like Denise and I also think that she really loves her aunt. But I kept thinking to myself, why do you keep trying to have these keep it real conversations with Wendy when Wendy's over there in La La Land? Which is why I really appreciated how like Black China dealt with Wendy. I mean, that was so touching. I cried. I'm like honest with me and like put me in my place. Yeah. You know what I mean? In like the most motherly, kind way. That's why I love you so much. Because even when I was going through my darkest times, like you never used that against me. You know what I mean? And that's how you know that the love is like genuine and it's always yeah. going to be there. You know, and I'm always being for you, like straight up. You can call my phone whenever. I'm so serious. And I think I'm going to be back and forth from New York, so I'm going to be coming to see you more. Well, my real name is Wendy Hunter. Hunter. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm divorced. Yes. He's got no money. Oh my goodness, I have such a newfound respect for Black China. Alright, back to business. I know that Kevin Jr. is young, but when you get the official diagnosis that your mom has dementia, you have to immediately get that paperwork in place. You gotta get that power of attorney signed and notarized, and you have to get the healthcare proxy, living will, and the last will and testament in place. Cause you gotta know that at a certain point, they can't legally sign those documents. All right, so even though I think that William Selby, Wendy's manager slash jeweler, is a hot freaking mess who's lying in his own pockets and exploiting Wendy for personal gain, I can give him credit for at least being there because it looks like if he wasn't there, then nobody would be there. But he shouldn't be there because Wendy shouldn't be working anymore. At a certain point, you gotta shut down the showtime. And I get it, Wendy still wants to do a podcast. But Wendy can't do podcast, which means no trips to California and no meetings with NBC. I mean, come on, Sean Zanotti. I cannot believe that this chick right here took Wendy Williams all the way to California to meet with the reps at NBC and actually let Wendy Williams show them her feet. But this is why, once again, you can't rely on her employees to take care of her. Because their only affection for and connection to Wendy is that she signs their checks. And while we're on this subject, everybody in the documentary is running around talking about, oh, Wendy's an alcoholic. 
Except for the rare occasions when Wendy is at a restaurant, Wendy has no access to alcohol unless y'all take it to get it or y'all bring it to her. Because I am quite sure that Wendy isn't over there on the internet like ordering from Grubhub and Instacart. So, once again, part of Wendy's problem is the yes men and the enablers. But I'm so glad that at least the cameramen had a little bit of common sense because they were able to bring it to everybody's attention that um we really have a problem. Yo, do you guys notice that we have a problem? And then after that it appeared that everybody in Wendy's circle sort of woke up a little bit. Because I mean before that, Wendy's running around the streets of New York City in a bathrobe barefoot and these dudes are acting like this is completely normal. And another thing that really bothered me is that throughout the documentary a lot of Wendy's family members and her management team made remarks that made it seem as if they believe that if Wendy just stops drinking, the problem is going to resolve itself or regress. But that's not the case because dementia and alcohol related dementia don't work that way. It's not that Wendy's dementia and aphasia got better when she stopped drinking. What was happening is that when Wendy was drinking, the alcohol was mixing with the prescription medications that she's on to help slow the progression of her diseases. Therefore, the difference that you saw when Wendy seemed a little bit more lucid wasn't that the dementia was getting better, it's that the alcohol wasn't mixing with the meds. Now, as far as the court-appointed guardian is concerned, that's a joke. Because Wendy needs 24-7 care. And there's no way on God's green earth that Sabrina Morrissey can work at a law firm and be the guardian for several cognitively impaired individuals and still focus on Wendy's needs. Impossible. And I find it to be an absolute travesty that William Selby has access to Wendy and her family doesn't. Let me tell you something. There is no way. No way that an outside person will ever have access to my mother, especially if she has dementia and I don't. That would never happen. So what really needs to happen is that Kevin Jr. needs to be given durable power of attorney. Why? Because that's the way Wendy Williams originally set it up. So that's what she wanted. And I believe in following people's wishes. And Wendy needs to be released into her son's care because she needs to be with family. And those are the people that really love her. Now, when the courts revisit this, if the family is given power of attorney, they need to realize that Wendy Williams is going to need round-the-clock care. It's not part-time work to deal with somebody with dementia. And they're going to have to hire a home health aide or something to come in and like stay with Wendy. And this is key. Once she's down there, everybody has to recognize that Wendy Williams is officially retired. So there's no more need for meeting with NBC and there's no more podcast. And there's no need for an everyday management team. So no more Will Selby. Once they manage to shut down all the lights, the cameras, and the action, Kevin Jr. needs to hire a new attorney with no links to his father and a financial expert who also has no connections to Big Kev and have that person help him manage all of the assets related to Wendy's income, assets, and royalties while the family focuses on a physical and mental well-being. And Kevin Jr. should also work with a financial manager to set up a reasonable budget to help him care for Wendy and provide for her long-term care and to ensure that he doesn't blow all of her dough on things like Uber Eats. I'm trying to tell you, little Kevin Jr. is going to have to grow up quick. And I understand that there's a certain lifestyle that he's accustomed to, but I mean really, he's going to have to learn how to take his behind to the grocery store and cook. <laughs> Listen, I am so sorry to see what's going on with Wendy, and I'm definitely praying for her and her family. But guess what? This right here is part of life. And you know what? Life is difficult sometimes. But one thing is good. We can learn from this. One, make sure that you have your paperwork in order. And also understand that part of raising your kids is preparing them to know what to do if something goes wrong with you. I mean, my grandmother used to be a stickler. She's like, Sauce, let me show you where everything's at. This is my paperwork. This is my checks. This is my bank account. These are my statements. This is this. I mean, she was ready. So when something eventually did happen, I was ready too. And I get it. A lot of us in the black community are not like doomsday preppers, but we got to prep. Two, make sure that you stop by and check on your family. Seeing each other at funerals is not enough. And three, we gotta recognize that as a community, we have power. So we gotta keep an eye on this situation so we can ensure that Wendy ends up back with her family because that's the best place for her. Listen, let me know what you think about this whole situation with Wendy. Let me know what you think about the documentary and let me know 
who do you think should be Wendy's guardian? Let me know in the comments. And hey yo, thanks for tuning in to Celeb Source, your source for celebrity news. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Peace.